Okay, I think we're ready to go ahead and get going. We've got, people are still jumping on, but we'll keep seeing that increase. Good morning to all of those of you who are with us already today. Great to see, let's see, we've got Laura's face. The rest of you are hiding behind cameras. That's okay. We're still happy to have you here. Uh, we've got Laura Ely and Kevin Ames with us today. I'm gonna take a second and introduce Laura to you. She's going to be our first presenter today. And Laura is recently moved to Atlanta, so we're excited that Zoom and virtual presentations are a thing so that we have the opportunity to be with her today. Laura is a work culture and experience advisor, and she works for a company that's called Plus One. She'll tell you a little bit more about that, but she also, she spends a lot of her time focused on those, on those topics, but she also has a background being an HR practitioner, so she was able to be in in the weeds of helping people solve their company problems. So we're excited to learn from her expertise. And when she is done, she'll turn the time over to Kevin Ames, who is the president of Ames Leadership Institute. Most of you are familiar with him, but um, he does consulting and has expertise around personal and professional development. So without further ado, Lara, we will turn the time over to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Amanda. And hey, everyone, I am seeing your faces or rather your names and I'm imagining your faces of those that I know. Um, and thanks so much for, for joining in the conversation today. Um, when Kevin asked me to join him, um, not so many weeks ago, um, I jumped at the opportunity because uh, those that you know, Kevin, know that he um, inspires people to kind of think and, and bring their best. And um, I've had the opportunity to co-present and co-facilitate with Kevin over the years on many occasions for different organizations that we've partnered with together. And uh, it just feels like this is long overdue for us to be having this conversation um, together and then obviously bringing you into that. So I would just invite you to have an open, uh, open chat, uh, throw your comments or your feedback, um, things that you like, um, things that you disagree with. I invite all of that perspective. I think it helps me think on this topic and it helps me really get to know you. Um, a little bit later, I'll, I'll specifically uh, pull you with a couple questions that I have just to get to know a little bit more about what's top of mind for you on this topic. But what I want to do is um, give you a little bit of context as to when I think about this word being boldly better. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, do a quick check. Um, Amanda, are you good seeing my screen here? Yep, we've got gotcha. you. Thanks, Laura. Wonderful. Awesome. So um, I have spent my career, as Amanda said, both as an HR practitioner and then more recently in the past about um, 12 years, working as a consultant to multinational organizations, um, primarily working with executive leaders or HR leaders and talking about how they dream up futures beyond their present best. Um, I've had the unique opportunity to have a front row seat to the world's leading organizations um, where they have uh, not only kind of um, have, have goals uh, about where their organization will go, will go that are kind of stretch goals, but in many ways they've already created really wonderful places to work. And I can't tell you the amount of times I was in conversations with those leaders and, and Kevin has been as well, where they've said, you know, we're already really good, but we wanna be better. We're always in pursuit of better. Um, but what I have learned about organizations that are on the uh, track of being better is that they have to be really bold and they have to be really brave. And that requires courage um, it requires vision and it requires, um, you know, leadership um, at, at its core, right? Bold and brave leadership. And I know this is a group um, of a lot of leaders, um, whether you lead people, whether you lead organizations, whether you lead yourself, you lead your family, um, you lead your team, your colleagues. Um, I think everybody can kind of ascribe this word leadership to yourself. So um, I want to talk a little bit about a topic that I love and I have built a consulting practice around. So um, as Amanda mentioned, I uh, represent, I'm a co-founder of a business called Plus One Workplace Culture Consulting. Um, we are a division of a really great organization called One Workplace that's based out of San Francisco. Um, they really, our, our organization that we're part of at One Workplace, really help create inspiring environments and places where in individuals, employees thrive. Um, they are made up of really great workplace thinkers. And I had the opportunity about eight months ago to join them to really bring um, the HR audience into this conversation around work experience and workplace. Um, so when I, a moment, when I, when I talk about work experience, I'll define that further as we get through our conversation today. But what I would just propose to you is I think we can all agree 
that the work experience of the future is just going to look different than it does today. Um, and I don't necessarily know that we needed a pandemic to tell us that. I think it's something that we have known for quite a while um, that the future is certainly not going to look like the past and it's not even going to look like the, 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 the present. Um, the last conference, and maybe you all can all reflect for a moment on the last physical big gathering you were part of. Um, I had the opportunity in October of 2019, which feels such like a distant memory ago now to be able to join Gartner's uh, Reimagine HR conference that's targeted uh, towards senior HR leaders and getting them thinking about sort of the latest and greatest on the future of work. And I attended a session, it was one of my favorites by a lady named Carrie Brown. She has become one of my favorite thought contributors that I follow, check her out, she's awesome. Carrie with a K Brown. She is SAP's uh, Vice President of Workforce Transformation. So she really all is uh, about focused on kind of expanding the way that the organization thinks about how they can embrace change and embrace the future. And she presented some really compelling data about this idea of what will the future of work look like. And she talked, of course, about who is the future, the people of the future, right? Now, this is not a conversation or it wasn't a data point to disregard the fact that um, the future generations of the workforce are more important than the current generations, um, right? We know that there's value of having multiple generations represented in the workplace. But she talked a little bit about just the stark reality of the fact that as of last year, 2020, 24% of the global workforce, and I know we have some people um, represented from London on the phone. I know uh, we've got some of my, um, my, my great friends over in Australia that likely will be listening to a recording back of this. And so for you with a global mindset, this statistic was saying that Gen Z showed up last year in a big way across the world, 24% of the workplace. In 2025, there is this suggestion that 75% of the global workforce will be millennial. And then probably a bigger statistic that really haunted me and got me thinking even bigger was the fact that children, so all of you who have little kiddos at home and maybe they're sitting next to you doing their homework, but of those kids who are entering primary school in 2021, so this year, 65% of them will be working in job categories, not just job types or different jobs that exist today, not because they got fed up and they chose to go somewhere else, but job categories that don't even exist today. And the reality is that's happening because of the progression of uh, new generations, new thinking coming into the workplace, yes, but it's more so because of advancements in things like robotics, in biotechnology innovations, right, in, in all kinds of um, AI type uh, type progressions of the automation of the workplace that's causing people to have to um, not just rely on the tasks that they did to help them be successful in the future, but they're really having to bring their thinking, their best thinking. And so this innovation that's happening is really changing the way that the, the world looks. And so there were a couple other interesting things that I think that, that were being predicted before this pandemic that I think are ref uh, worth reflecting on. Um, McKinsey in 2019 posted this really interesting idea that you know 51% of job activities that were done at the time in 2019 could be automated, right? So if that much is being automated, what jobs will arise for people to do that use their mind that and, and the things that make them uniquely human? By 2022, AI, the World Economic Forum said, will create 58 million new jobs. And one something that has stood with me that, that Carrie talked about was this idea of the rise, even by 2022, of about 43% of at least the U.S. workforce being expected to consist of freelance workers. And isn't it interesting that the pandemic has created almost more of an awareness of this more than ever? Um, you see people who are now saying, you know what, I don't need a company to necessarily define my worth. I have knowledge, I have value. And if a company is not going to respect me enough and all the boundaries that, that I need or the flexibility that I need, well, I'll just go take my knowledge and I'll try to figure out how to be an entrepreneur and package this up myself. Um, in fact, uh, Kevin and I were just chatting right before we started today. And uh, I am right in the middle of a home renovation project. 
my dad, I'm grateful for um, him. He is a general contractor. And so he, one of the most valuable things he has done, and I've tried to help him understand this, is not just the tasks that he's doing for my husband and I as we're building this home, but it's actually the, the, the consulting that he's giving us of all those in-between jobs and helping us have some foresight into ways we can kind of step around some obstacles that we all come across if you've ever been in the middle of a home renovation. And I've tried to help him realize as he is um, one of those individuals who is well into the years where he should be retired, but he has always uh, loved the loved the act of doing work, really helping him to convert from this contractor who does a task mentality to a consultant who gives and sells their knowledge mentality. And that that is something that he could be well into his 90s doing, right? So this statistic, I think, was, was so um, interesting to me and, and, and predictive of a future that we're seeing uh, the pandemic only progress. There was also the suggestion that you've already looked at here, but it's just within the next 10 years, right? Accenture was saying that there would be a new global 2000 company where there were actually no full-time employees outside of maybe the C-suite. So again, that, that idea of people understanding their value is what they think and what they know, and then packaging that is kind of the, the, the world of the future. So we have probably all fallen, uh, not, not victim, I don't know that that's the right articulation, but we have all probably used this analogy of, man, wouldn't it be great if I had a crystal ball of what the future was going to look like, specifically as we look into these big, you know, dense urban areas like San Francisco, like Atlanta, like Salt Lake City even, um, or where, like London, wherever you find yourself in the world. What is, what is that going to look like? Well, what I would just challenge that thinking with a little bit, and I've tried to challenge my own thinking, is that I really do think we can already imagine what the working world will look like. I think that there is enough data out there about um, how the world is going to require, outside of maybe science, technology, engineering, and mathematic thinkers and contributors, the world is going to need people's skill sets that are uniquely human. So I would rephrase this crystal ball desire moment to say what experiences rather than if we know what that, that working world is going to look like, what those generations that are going to lead the future, um, what, what uh, automation is going to do for the type of unlearning and relearning that, that the world is going to have to get to know and get to do, um, what experiences do we need to create to help people come alive or bring their best self or feel the most connected to the organizations that they serve and then the clients and customers that they that they get to serve ultimately in the end. And I think a big question then that has arisen of, of this crystal ball moment that we're all asking ourselves in the middle of the pandemic is, well, then what is the role of place? And for those of you that know my story, again, I've consulted on the topic of culture for many years, but I joined up with One Workplace um, because I was really interested in the way they had this philosophy of figuring out how these experiences, which are often intangible, right? The ways we onboard, the onboard, the ways we recognize, the ways we live and be well together, um, maybe the ways that we um, our, our 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 performance is evaluated, the ways we connect in meetings and gatherings, those are oftentimes intangible experiences, but they happen in a place, and that place workplace, I would just propose to you is not only just physical, it is the digital and the technology experience. And so I really bring a unique perspective to my clients of being able to help them blend these cultural norms and these experiences that they want to happen with the places, digital and physical, that support them best. I was actually talking with um, a, a client of mine. She is a, a leader of organizational strategy at a big financial services firm. Um, they are doing some really interesting thinking about how do we take an age old audit and tax practice and really innovate in a really transformative way. And because of the pandemic, she had her CEO come to her and say, hey, we need to figure out how we um, revamp our usage of place. And we think rather than that being just a real estate solve, it's got to be a people and strategy solve. It's got to be the person looking for out for our culture. Go figure that out. <laughs> and she said, um, I'm not sure I'm equipped to do that. I'm not sure if I understand enough about how place impacts culture or culture impacts place. 
Uh, Laura, I think you work with organizations on this. Will you help me? And what what she started doing was, I think, what a lot I'm seeing a lot of organizations that I get the opportunity to work with doing. They're solving problems like what's our max occupancy rate, right? She was saying, you know, how do I make sure I've got really good security uh, protocols in place or safety protocols in place, like hand washing stations, and how do I know? how I get people to, to check their temperature when they enter the building. Um, and if for whatever reason they do have a temperature, how do I gracefully get them to exit without embarrassing and, and res while respecting their privacy? So she's of course going to this very practical solve. And um, what, what I sensed in her though, was this desire to be able to say, ultimately though, this is what I have to do. These practical tasks of returning to the office are things I have to do. But something in me remembers that that we've all experienced something together right now that has changed our needs and our desire for what the workplace can provide. And I really want to lead a different project, but I just don't know how. And it was interesting. Her sentiment to me uh, reminded me of a conversation I was having with a, a think tank that I got to participate in about a month ago that was hosted by the University of California in San Francisco, so UCSF. And this think tank was hosted by uh, the, the, the team of leaders at UCSF who basically facilitate all of their big events and gatherings. And if you've been to San Francisco and you've seen UCSF campus, UCSF's campuses, you know that they've got really big centers that host those big conferences. Um, and their question was, do we ever need these conferences again? Um, do we ever imagine a world where people will feel comfortable or will even desire to, to fly halfway around the world to come to these big conference centers. And if not, you know, what do we need to do with all of this real estate that we have? And where our conversation led us, um, being in San, being at San Francisco specifically, um, or a largely San Francisco based um, think tank, it was interesting because usually that group of thinkers say, oh, well, we'll just look to the world's leading organizations, people who have typically always led out on really innovative thinking around what the work experience should be, Apple, Google, you name it, right? These big tech companies that we would all probably reference as we think about who we look to to lead the future. And she said, you know, they actually are all kind of in our same place. They're they're sort of on this journey of, of stops and starts, right? Where they're progressing forward with maybe a, a direction they think is is the way to go, but then you know the 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 state shuts down again, and we're back under lockdown, or there's new rules, and as time goes by, we're learning more about what people actually want and need, and and they're really not moving forward at the pace of change that you would think they would. And it it reminded me of this analogy of um, if you have driven down a road, which we all have, and you have then that person you're driving along and somebody races past you, you know, weaves in and out of traffic only to get stopped at a stoplight, right? And then you find yourself inching up next to them and looking over at them going, you know, was that, did you really need to do that? Was that beneficial? And so this analogy sort of, I brought this analogy to that think tank and they said, yes, absolutely. I think every organization is not moving forward at the pace of change that you would think they are yet because we're all kind of have these stop gaps that the pandemic is creating related to our thinking on this topic. So I share that analogy to say, if you find yourself in um, my, my colleague or my client who, who is uh, leading that tax advisory services firm, or um, you know, like one of these big tech companies who's trying things, what I would just say is you're not too late to be thinking about this. What does the future look like? And you actually don't have to just rush to, fall, to, to solve the hows of how people will come back but rather have a moment to pause and really think about why um, you might go back and what is the, the, the new work experience that you could create that would create that, that, that bold, better future. So a couple other statistics I thought I would just share with you that are really interesting to me. We, um, what, at One Workplace and Plus One, we have a research partner in Steel and Steelcase. Um, they have a global research team and they, they released a report just hot off the press in January of 2021. And they shared some interesting data. This was a global study. So for those of you that are outside of the United States, um, I have, I'll link this for you so that you can follow up and read the research related to your own um, geography or your own country. Um, but ultimately, there were four perspectives that I thought would be interesting to our discussion today. One is that how often do people actually expect to work from home? And the answer of the study of about over 32,000 employees globally participating in the study was that 
they do expect to work from home, but a far less often than we might think. So 54% of the respondents, at least in the U.S., said, you know, maybe one day a week or less. You know, I think as long as I have that option one day, gosh, that'll save me that commute time or that'll allow me to work around my partner's schedule or whatever it might be. There's also another interesting insight that came out of this is at early on in the pandemic, right? As early as maybe April, 2020. So really, really early on after lockdowns were starting around the world, leaders anticipated you know, that there would certainly be a, a desire for flexibility or a need for flexibility, but that has only increased as the duration of the pandemic has gone on. So proving that this moment and to change habits and beliefs um, takes some time. And now having been in this as long as we have, albeit around the world, we've We've opened and reopened in different waves, um, but only uh, only is this moment helping us get leaders in that mindset that we do need an increase of flexibility. There's also this idea of leaders saying, well, yeah, if we need more flexibility, well, of course our work policies have to change. Of course, we're not just gonna show up the same way we did, right? So in September of 2020, people were saying 85% people said, I will expect my work to have a different stance on how we show up in the future at work at a physical office. And then from that conclusion led this really interesting, uh, you know, word that we've all now grown, grown to know, which is the word hybrid, right? Hybrid work. And the studies have resoundingly showed, right? Whether or not you have found this in your own organization through surveys that you've conducted or participated in, um, or maybe you're, you're reading lots of sources out there related to this hybrid work environment. But basically what the studies are showing resoundingly is that fewer people want only to work from home. A few more are more interested in having that kind of quiet focused space of office, but resoundingly people are saying, I want hybrid. I want both. I want choice. I want option. Um, and, and ultimately helping organizations figure out what hybrid means to them and even then what workplace means and evolving that definition is really where I find myself working with organizations. So let me just pause for a second and I want to get your point of view on um, a couple of things just to understand more about where you're at. So use the chat um, responding with either the letter A, B or C aligned to sort of the perspective that you most closely identify with. I just love to, to hear your thoughts on this. So um, and Amanda, maybe I'll have you help me just to make sure I have visibility to the chat as I'm pulling this up. But what point of view do you think your organization, whether you're leading it or you're just an active participant, um, will take in, in, in thinking about this return, right? Will, will you, A, you know, work from home primarily as your primary work model? Um, you know, you'll likely pr pr potentially reduce your real estate footprint significantly. Um, your office, everybody says, yeah, come back to the office. And then a hybrid approach will work for you. Where are you at with that? I'm just gonna watch your comments roll in here. So I've got some A's, got some C's. Okay, so it's kind of actually a mix. And what I'm gonna assume to that is actually that I think a lot of people don't yet know. <laughs> I was wondering if you would all kind of lean towards the C, but I think that this is just proving that point, right? The journey of stops and starts. Um, you know, organizations really don't quite know yet where they're going to be at, you know, and, and what I would say is even those organizations that have largely come out and, and I'll be they few who've said, yep, indefinitely, you can work from home. We're going to close all of our real estate. Actually, I've got a client who is choosing to do that. They're closing all of their corporate headquarters and they're just going to move to more outco uh, outpost environments. Um, they basically have said, you know what, we, we, we believe there is a value in gathering, but we've got to gather differently. But I think even with that work from home, what they're still recognizing is that the experience that people have will be disrupted and they have to thus evolve that, uh, that, 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 that ask. Um, I'm seeing a comment here. So I was slightly distracted by this because I think it's a really good point. This, you know, we've asked everyone to come back to work. Um, yeah, I, I think there are a lot of companies that are are choosing that. Actually, my husband's company is is in that same boat. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, how do you define essential workers? And maybe you're in an industry like healthcare or you're in a manufacturing environment where you largely rely on people being together to do a trade and do a physical job. We'll talk a little bit more in a minute about how do you deal with that? And maybe those team members who don't feel that same need or that essential worker mentality to be back, how do you create equity and how do you still listen to the needs that have arisen in this moment? So it's interesting to see where some of you are at with that. Okay, next question. 
where are you at in planning for their future of work experience? Have, have a, you know, some of you've collected employee feedback or you've heard of your organization collecting that feedback. Maybe your organization has developed a point of view and then communicated that to employees. Great. Awesome. Um, B, you've collected feedback, at, but you haven't really yet shaped that point of view. Um, you just have that feedback and you're still in the middle of digesting it or maybe collecting it. Um, or then C, you've not developed a plan, but you know it's on your organization's mind. Where are you at with that? I think I, think I see a couple A's. That's really interesting. Wow, I'm seeing a lot of A's. And I think something I would suggest, um, really interesting, Stacey, I'm just seeing your comment about, you know, large company, you know, familiar, you know, with, with this idea of hybrid, um, a few days, you know, in the office each week or, or, or you know, a few days off. I think this is the thing that I would I would I, and I was wondering if this would be the perspective. So I think what we're what I'm finding with organizations that I'm working with is they are developing a point of view quickly, but now they have this work of saying, okay, but now hybrid means all of those rituals of work that we share, all of those ways that we connected and gathered and belonged to one another and bumped into each other and celebrated together. Now, how and where do we write new rituals into our employees' experience that have people run in with each other, right, in the same way they would have done if they had had a little bit more of that proximity to each other while in the office? So we'll talk about that more in a minute. And then last question is just tell me what keeps you up at night, or maybe you've got a buddy leading this initiative, and, and what, keep, what do they tell you is sort of their biggest lament about planning this future work experience? Is it that they really have executive leadership that just doesn't have the same maybe readiness. Um, maybe they've got some leaders that are a little bit more antiquated in their thinking about the future or really comfortable with the status quo. And then they've got others that are driving forward. So that misalignment, um, maybe they're really focused about just equity, right? You talked a little bit about this. We've, we've, where we talked about this, you've brought some people back, but what do you do with those people who, who aren't back, right? And how do you create it, create an equitable experience? Or maybe it's just, your middle management, right? I've had so many organizations say, my middle managers really just aren't listening and they're not adapting their thinking to what their people need. And I'm seeing resoundingly in the chat that it is this equitable experience. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I think that's so true, um, especially in this moment where diversity and equity and inclusion is something that is top of all of our minds. I think how we represent that in the way that we give flexibility and choice, um, but at scale is something that I hear all of my clients talking about. So I wanna teach you quickly about three different design principles. Thanks for responding in the, the chat there that helps me kind of know where to direct today. But a design principle, some of you may be familiar with that language. It's essentially just a philosophy or a belief that you hold over an initiative that you then use as a lens to solve a problem through. So I help a lot of my organizations develop what design principles really do guide their initiatives. So I'm oftentimes leading discovery exercises and workshops with a lot of strategic thinkers to really understand these culture building initiatives that are happening. And then how do they use different principles and what do they think and, and introduce lots of different ways of thinking to them to ultimately decide how they move forward. So three of the ones related to this topic that I wanted to talk with you about today, I think will be good for you to take away. So the first one, I would just say as a philosophy for how you're, how you're thinking about this moment or I should also say there may be people on in this conversation today who aren't leading this work, but you have a seat at the virtual table of the group that is uh, that is is forming your belief as a company or your philosophy of uh, as a company of how you will return or how you'll work better in the future. So bring this thinking with you if you are one of those participants, um, or maybe if you're passionate about this, find a way to have a voice and use and introduce this different type of thinking into uh, those conversations within your workplace. So define differently. This is really all about, I think, being able to not look at a solve to a problem uh, the same way twice. You know, I think it's really easy to define and start with, again, like I mentioned, how are you going to get people back? And I think that's okay um, to be able to have a focus on that. But I think as um, Simon Sinek taught us through his Start With Why book, it is surprising to me how many organizations I am partnering with or I'm hearing about solving for this work and they have forgotten to start with that shared why. 
they have they've moved forward or they they kind of get caught up in this weaving around the traffic race um, to where they forget that they should actually take a moment to be able to really articulate why does the office even matter? What experience has our, our have our people gone through that would um, it, either encourage them um, or enable them or, or or inhibit them from being able to come back to a, an environment together? So I think something I, I would just leave you with with that is being able to take a moment to be really thoughtful about how you're listening to your people and defining why you're coming back. The second thing I I want to talk a little bit about is. Um, just designing the rituals of work. And I, I mentioned that just a moment ago, a lot of you said you're in that situation where your company has defined um, maybe a philosophy or point of view of how you'll show back up at work. Um, if the answer is we are going to work with some degree of flexibility and choice, how now then do we take all of these different interactions that people have from the way they join to the way they gather to the way we meet to the way we uh, we 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 celebrate, to the well we way we walk together, right? The way we learn and develop all of these things that have kind of followed the HR talk track for a long time. How are we going to redesign rituals that really help people um, get re-inspired? And what I would just suggest to you is that um, I, for a long time, have helped my clients develop. Um, things I call personas or we call personas, right? Um, many of you are familiar who uh, we learned as great, you know, external marketers. You always develop customer personas that allows you to get inside their head and know a little bit more about their needs and their drivers and their motivators. And we've been doing internal personification of employees for a long time. But I think in this moment, a, a misstep that I'm seeing a lot of organizations take is that they are going solely to look at those tasks that people do to tell them why people should be in the office or not be in the office, right? Do you have an essential job as a healthcare worker? You must be back in the office. You know, do you run a machine? And as a machinist, you must be in the office from or in the, the work environment from nine to five. And then these people, oh, you all just work at a computer. You're great. You can stay at home and maybe come in every every so often or or whatever that looks like. What I would just suggest to you is I think you have an opportunity to revisit either some personas that you've used in the past or reinvent new personas that really help you understand and listen to what people's experience has been. And I love some of the research that um, Steelcase has done. There's many organizations that have gone about kind of listening and learning about the common behavioral patterns that have arisen during this moment in time. But uh, Steelcase has some of my favorite work. and. What they researched is there really are five emerging patterns of how people have all experienced this moment. They learned that you know there's these overworked caretakers um, that where the home office is this nonstop flow of competing demands, right? And if you were to just ask them to come back, irregardless of what task they do, it would be kind of a traumatic experience, right? Um, maybe it's the relieved self-preservationists. I, I, I know someone who's like this that's related to me, and I won't say their name, but I'm like they love that the home office is the only safe place, and and they don't want to be they don't want to be ripped away from that safe place. Or the autonomy seeker, right, where the, the home office has been freedom for them. Or this frustrated creative worker, right, who is, you know, really sees this moment as a suspension from the normal life that allowed them to create and invent in the first place. Or this isolated Zoomer who's really lonely and really struggling. And what these behavioral personas or behavioral patterns tell us is that people, irregardless of task, have experienced something very intrinsically human, behaviorally human, uh, that needs to be addressed. And so I would just suggest, as you go about designing differently, that you think about these behavior patterns or others that you develop for your organization um, to, to, to think about that return strategy or that future strategy. So a couple better questions I just suggest that you ask yourself or you bring into those conversations that you're having with your colleagues around this is one, be clear, are, are we returning or are we reimagining the workplace? I think both are okay, but where are we at? Um, what motivates people to be together? Um, what must evolve about the workplace, you know, in order to, to de deliver that desired experience? So just a couple things I think will be helpful for you to, to start thinking about this topic. Second of the three, I'll just move through this quickly. Master your messaging. Maybe the number one thing that I am a little surprised by or a little irked by as I'm in conversations with, with teams talking about how they're going to tell their people about their philosophy or their point of view is 
I am hearing a lot of messages that what I what I would say invoke a sense of fear in people and not faith. Um, faith, right, is believing in something I don't see, but it gives me a sense of hope and it gives me a sense of movement towards the future. Whereas fear also is believing in something that may not be reality or I may not see, but it holds me back. It pushes me down. And so what I would just encourage you to do as a messenger, messenger of this change for yourself with your own teams or for the organizations that you work with, be really careful about adopting message, messaging that really inspires people's faith versus instills a fear in them. Just as a quick example of the two, I had an organization, you know, share with me sort of this statement and they've said, how does this sound? You know, okay, the return to California office locations will be governed by the CPHD blueprint for the safer economy uh, framework. Take note where you fall within the four color coded risk levels that indicate your office access restrictions and limitations. Great. That tells me exactly how you're handling this, but it doesn't exactly inspire a sense of, wow, I really want to come back to this place. Whereas if somebody were to say, you know, sort of this iterated version of, you know, we acknowledge that workplaces anywhere and everywhere and keeping you safe matters most to us. Your health, both your physical and your mental health guides our decision making regarding how we will work in the future. So just the subtle difference between some of this practical communication versus the more hopeful communication of the future, I think will help you really lift this message to your teammates. So ask yourself, right, better questions to be asking, what messaging am I or we using to describe this change? How is it maybe signaling fear or how is it maybe, how could it maybe shift, right, to signal more faith um, in the colleagues or the teammates that, that we're communicating to? So last topic, um, I'll move quickly through this just for sake of wanting to have plenty of time for some dialogue and, and for Kevin's reflections here in a moment. But I, I wanted to keep with the define differently master messaging and, you know, lead locally. But I want to just, I, I, I kept coming back to this phrase, you know, lead like a local. And what it made me think of is a conversation that I had with a CEO of a company last just last week. Um, and I had the opportunity to interview him. He's he's a CEO of a big financial services company, global financial services company. And I had the opportunity to ask him, you know, what have you learned about this time that's challenged your perspective of how we should work better or how we should work differently? Um, and how is that going on to sort of inform the way you hope your organization will function? And he brought up this idea of community. But he likened it to his neighborhood. And this is what he said. He, he kind of sat back in his chair. You know, I could see the, the birds chirping, you know, behind him. And he said, you know, Laura, I have received the most sense of, um, of, of, of feeling known, of feeling wanted, of feeling supported from my neighbors, from the people who literally we, on our daily walks, we would walk past them with our masks on and we would wave at each other and we got to know each other's dogs and we would cook each other's meals if we needed to. We actually let our kids kind of in a, a quarantine crew, like certain kids played with other kids to help us emotionally through this. And he said, you know, as I think about the future of the workplace, I hope it looks much more like a neighborhood than it does just a traditional kind of command and control uh, environment where people come just to do tasks. Because in that, I think actually people feel far more known and far more um more more alive in the sense of they they feel known they feel seen, and so it made me think a little bit about this idea of um, what if more organizations right started to de design rollout strategies of this uh, of their philosophy that was less about how we communicate this and it was more about how we live this new way of working and let's develop together new community and neighborhood guidelines that we all agree to play by. Because no longer is it about who's at the head of the table that has the decision on how we work, right? It really is about our collective beliefs about what we what we want out of this experience and our collective needs. At any given time, we may support one team member or another differently. I love that analogy. And I think using that philosophy of developing a community or a neighborhood guide is something that can only serve us well going forward. So the last thought I'll leave you with related to leading like a local is I think something that local communities do really well is they champion causes, right? They champion causes that are unique to that local community where they serve or where they, who, in which they belong. But they also inspire fo followership. And I was reminded of a video that I watched many years ago. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but, uh, ooh. 
apologize. I thought I muted the music on that. <laughs> but in this little video is uh, the, the video of a dancing guy at a festival. And if you go on and watch it on YouTube, it's really funny. It's poor quality, but it's essentially this guy just acting really silly in a field. And what happens is slowly but surely, um, sort of to his abandon, other people start to join in. And eventually, if you watch the video, what ends up happening is that enough people are dancing that rather than the guy who's dancing looking silly, everybody who's sitting down actually looks like the silly ones. And so what I what I took away from this video and what I've taught many organizations on related to creating kind of a an influencer network of this change is know who your first followers are of this movement. And maybe it's not just your middle managers who lead this change. Um, maybe it's actually the people who best have, have reckless abandon, right? Who, who are already believers of this future that you want to create. Um, they are very approachable, right? Um, that they, they, they welcome people into the journey without skepticism or without, um, without, without being ashamed, right? And it's really all about making it about the movement, right? It's not about them or their opinion. It's really about that common cause that they're championing together and make their advocacy for what you're doing very visible. And so I just, there's so many other lessons about kind of how to create movements that I could talk about, but I think this dancing guy lesson is a key one that I think is uh, something for us all to use. So a couple questions to leave you with, better questions. Um, how do I view myself as, or excuse me, rather, do I view myself as a community leader versus maybe um, I've always viewed myself as kind of a task manager, traditional management, right? Command and control. What community or neighborhood rituals might we adopt, right? That would really transform the way you think of your team and the way you create a sense of community and belonging. And then also, you know, who are your first followers of this movement and how are you leading them, right? To be able to have that visibility um, and to be able to really leverage the strength of their, of their belief in your cause or in your new definition of what the work experience should be. So I wanna just transition us into a moment of dialogue and invite Kevin to join me in something I brought to him when we were talking about this topic. Um, I, I said, Kevin, something surprised me about something I'm hearing about um, this moment. And I was sharing with him that I had had a conversation with a, a former client turned good friend of mine. Um, and Kevin knows this, this lady as well. Um, we'll keep her name anonymous, but, uh, but she, I was having a conversation with her. She's based in Perth, Australia. So um, for those that are listening later from Australia, this will feel near and dear to your experience. And I just asked her the question. I said, you know, do, everybody's looking for that crystal ball, right? What is the future going to look like? And um, what, what does it look like? What has been surprising to you about this moment? And she said, you know, Laura, I, I wish I could share something positive with you. I wish my surprise was a positive one, but she said, I actually am kind of disappointed um, in what I'm seeing. And, and, and the reason why she was disappointed is she said, you know, Australia, unlike America, came back to work a long time ago. We, we handled this pandemic super well. We got under control within the early months of the pandemic being a thing. And we have largely returned back to normal in many ways, uh, albeit, albeit the pandemic is certainly not non-existent, but it's a very different climate than it is here in the US or even in other parts of the world. And so she said, you know, as most people have come back into the office, I think what we're finding is we have a lot of leaders that are still stuck in the fact that they believe that things should not be different. And they've listened to the research and they've even heard now from their colleagues saying, you know, or their teammates saying, I don't want to come back, but they just have, there's a disconnect in terms of being able to take advantage of what this moment has all taught us. Um, that there should be flexibility and there should be choice. And they're really struggling to figure out how they overcome that bias. And so I just wanted to talk, I asked Kevin about this question because to me at the core, this is a leadership question, right? How do you lead leaders or challenge the thinking of leaders who really don't believe things should be different, who are set in their ways? And, and how can organizational leaders um, hold their people accountable um, to, to deal with that disbelief? So Kevin, I wanna pass it to you and just get your thinking on that because it is something I think a lot of organizations are already dealing with, but maybe we should take some advice from Australian colleagues and say, we might start to deal with that too here in America. 
Yeah, thank you. And, and I, I really appreciate these topics, Laura. Laura always does a great job uh, bringing us a lot of creative thinking and interesting thinking. And uh, this is no different today. When I deal with the executive team, C-suites of, of organizations all over the world and the size of the organization rarely matters, we find groups that are really stuck. They've learned how to manage and lead one particular way, and they have a very difficult time changing and adapting to, to new things. And so command and control stays in place often, uh, strict measurement, uh, micromanagement, that's how they learned how to, to lead and that's how they got where they are. And the ability for them to change and start to think uh, in a new way is, is a very difficult thing. So we have a tremendous responsibility. Everybody that's uh, really on these webinars and the people that Laura and I and others deal with most of the time are in leadership positions. And we have a responsibility to try to rethink, reimagine what leadership should be. And this is a good time. We've been forced into a new mindset because of the pandemic. And I, I think a number of great things have come from that, forcing us to go home and learn that we can trust people to work from home. We can see results are produced from uh, freelance work, if you will, and, and people having the freedom to, to work as they will. I think a lot of good has come from that, but it's going to still be a challenge to change those mindsets. And I think one of the things that we have to do is, is finally move towards a results-based philosophy. And those of us that work and consult with organizations try to help these C-suite leaders, because if it doesn't start at the top, we're not gonna have the support to move down through that middle management group, that leadership group, because they won't feel compelled or safe even to do it. And I think safety is one of the key things, Laura, that comes out of what you've talked today is creating a safe environment for leaders to make this move and then for employees to be uh, accepted in it. But I think if we could move to the concept of results-based management instead of micromanagement, instead of managing structure and time, rather manage results. We hired people really to get results in the first place, not, not to give us eight hours a day. And I think it's time for us to go ahead and make that move. We've hired you to produce these results. And if you produce those results, I'm not overly concerned with where you're producing them or how much time is associated with producing them, but much rather, what is the quality of those results? What are we getting? And I know, you know, before the pandemic, a lot of offices had changed to open offices and uh, the calendar and the, and the time of day didn't matter as much. People could come and work whenever and wherever they wanted to and in many businesses. And it seemed to to work well. Uh, other companies tried to replicate it just by changing the furniture and not by changing their, their philosophy about what was going on. And that doesn't work. So we've got to have a wholesale change. We've got to accept a new day. And the question becomes for the leader, am I actually concerned about whether my employer is thriving or am I concerned about whether I'm thriving? Am I concerned about the behavior of my employee or am I concerned about my behavior and my control of their behavior? And I think that the mindset shift is towards the employee. We still want productivity. We still want results, obviously. That's why we're all doing this. But I can change my philosophy, my approach to how I get that done. And we'd love to get some feedback from you guys, either on the chat or you can uh, step up and uh, speak to us for uh, a few minutes that we have. Uh, give us some ideas about how you think these, these changes can take place. But I, I think one of the things that Laura brought up was this idea of imagination. Uh, Henry James says, it's time you started living the life you've imagined. Well, it's time that we started ima start imagining what 2021 and 22 is going to look like in the future after that. And it has to be imagined first and then put in place. So we've got to start thinking creatively about how we're going to handle this hybrid situation. How are we going to discover which employee really wants to be in the office, enjoy that sociality that comes with that, works best there versus the one that wants to be home all the time, produce great results from there, and the others that want to be hybrid. So interested in some other thoughts uh, from, from you folks while we have a few minutes. Anybody want to chime in and give us some, some uh, thoughts on that? And just jump in. If not, we'll completely take over. <laughs> Kevin, I, I'll I'll open it up to to maybe ask the group a, a specific question um, related to that. I think Kevin, you, you articulated something, or you re-emphasized something that I spoke about about organizations developing or personifying the needs of their employees as a lens or as a language to help leaders who may be in a state of disbelief 
listen to how we're designing or design differently um, than just simply saying, well, you do this job, you need to be back in the office, right? And I'm not listening to you as a person. And so I'm curious, is anyone privy on this call to you know, their organization or other organizations who are doing certain persona work or how are you, how are you elevating the needs of your people um, to be able to, to, to help your leaders who may be in a state of disbelief listen and listen differently? Quite tough, tough question. <laughs> tough well, question. And it, you know, it's it's something that we focus on all the time. We ha we've never really been away from this focus, this this idea of mindset change. And, and if we if we re remember that as a leader, we have the ability to influence people. We don't have the ability to again command and control and drive people places, but we can have influence. The influence will come from our changing our philosophy. And thinking back towards the idea of, is this particular employee thriving? Is this particular employee able to flourish with the kind of work style that we've identified will work for them? And are we going to create a safe environment and one where they have approval to do this, to be themselves and to work the best way for themselves? They have a responsibility to be responsible to that clearly, but most people will be. And I think what we discovered with COVID is the, the masses are, are more than responsible to work from home and do great work. So the idea now is, can we get, you know, something else done? So again, still interested in your comments if you have some. Yeah, I see Desiree, you had a really interesting question. How does this apply to healthcare? I've had this same conversation with a, a friend of mine, actually Kevin knows her as well. We got to do some work with this particular healthcare uh, company up in Boise, Idaho. Um, and she is the head of employee experience. And, you know, I think her, her stall for this, you know, Desiree is, is in being able to at least convey messaging um, and convey a philosophy of, of, for the entire, you know, health system that respects the fact that people have all had different needs, right? You have an overworked caretaker who still has to show up as, as that nurse, right? Or you have somebody who maybe has felt like an isolated correct creative who is part of your marketing team. And now you're gonna, or your PR team as a health network and you're gonna now send them home forever, right? And so there's still all of these needs, I think that even within healthcare, you have to identify that people have and find ways and adjust rituals that show empathy toward those needs that people have. So I would say, of course, in industries where you have essential workers, as we have defined them, that need to show up in a physical place, there is that decision. But then the work begins of adjusting their experience that still shows empathy to their situation. I don't know if that helps or any thoughts further on that, Desiree. You know, it's interesting too, that uh, as, as we talk to many different companies, uh, there's a lot of businesses, a lot of companies, a lot of markets where the work from home thing isn't going to be an option. Uh, it, you know, if you if you have a hospital and you're caring for patients in hospitals, very difficult to do that from home, isn't it? So uh, those people are going to come back. The question is, have we learned anything from all of this? Now, obviously, most of you have had to stay there and, and we're still in that situation where we're putting in long hours and, and doing all kinds of things. Can we rethink that? I just did some work with a large health system down in San Antonio over the last few months, and we're trying to rethink how do, how do we create a better work environment for our people, given what's going on? They're, they're not going to be able to go home and do their nursing from there. What can we do then to make it a more comfortable workplace? So the rethinking and the reimagining of our workplace isn't going to be just about hybrid. It isn't going to be just about are we going to let them work from home or are we going to let them work from here? I think the bigger point is how do we make here the right kind of place to work at? The majority of my friends that I associate with want to go back to work. Uh, they kind of want, they've had enough of home actually and they're kind of feeling like I want to get back in the office a little bit. I want to socialize. I want to escape a little bit back into that space. And so there are going to be those places where, you know, people are going to come back in a big way. But I do think that this is an opportunity for us in leadership to think about how we're going to recraft our workplace environment. And I like uh, up front, Laura mentioned the workplace versus the work experience. Let's change our mindset towards work experience and away from workplace. For a long time, we've, we've used the industrial age thinking about workplace and specific amounts of time. Let's move away from that. Let's think about creating a work experience that really makes a difference. 
I think we're getting some good stuff uh, in our chat. Laura, do you want to address some of those? Yeah, I'd yes. love to. So I love that um, from, from P, whoever P is, um, team members are longing for connection to both people and purpose, any ideas for reimagining water cooler interactions that build community? Absolutely. And actually, I'm gonna tie this to a thought I had on healthcare. So healthcare has always had, I've worked a lot in healthcare institutions and, and I, I think that they have always had the challenge of their back of house staff. How do they feel most connected to the patient to care, the care that they produce, right? The, the mission and purpose of healthcare is, is obvious and vibrant and important work, but there are still so many people that work within healthcare networks that don't feel connected to that purpose. And so I think now more than ever, um, the opportunity to, to draw you know, that the people who do sit behind the scenes who maybe indefinitely will be allowed or, or for a time allowed to work more from home than in the hospital or in the, the clinic, um, finding really interesting and meaningful ways to create connection and create gathering. And that, again, could be through run-ins that we have through different ways we imagine uh, technology rituals, right? Right. Gatherings that we, we orchestrate virtually. Um, but it also, I think I'm seeing a lot of interesting organizations. Uh, UCSF is pioneering a lot of this as well, where they're thinking about intentional moments on a weekly or a quarterly basis where they will facilitate small group neighborhood like gatherings where people can come and connect and ask questions and and have that physical connection that they long for. So, again, I think it's still using place. But it's not expecting that people will just naturally bump into each other. It's got to be more thoughtful and more intentional and more on design, as Kevin and I like to say. Yeah, and I, I think to Stacy's point, it, it's not going to be the same for everyone. And if we're thinking in terms of work experience versus mm -hmm. just the workplace and our on our management of workplace, now we have the opportunity to go to three days and four days. I I know a number of people that that do four day weeks. They they, they put in the hours, they do four day weeks, they have a three day weekend and uh, really love that flow. Uh, obviously in the medical community, I, I have uh, children uh, that work in the medical business and work three days a week and are off three days and so forth. A lot of options and I, I don't sure the options are the question. I think it's whether leadership has the ability to trust in their people and have they built that environment. And it's not the people's problem primarily, it's the leadership's purview of that and how I feel about it. And what I like about what's happened over the last year or so is that we have learned to trust. And I think now we have to extend it because, it, you know, as we start to fold out of this a year from now or so, it'll start to be more natural. And uh, I hope we don't go back to the control concept. I hope we can stay in this idea that there is hybrid available to everyone. And as leaders, all of us that are in leadership positions, I think we have to start that process. Start thinking about how would we support it? How are we going to voice this message, especially up the line, how are we going to communicate up line uh, so that our executive teams get it and are supportive of that? And again, create that sense of safety for people to be able to make decisions to work from different places as we go or to adopt the full time workplace. If, if that's where we have to do the bulk of our work, we're right at the end of our time and we really appreciate uh, Laura coming in or just give you a couple of minutes for any final thoughts you might have. Yeah, I'll just wrap up with something I was reading through your comments and, you know, this thought on, you know, diversity or choice, right? At the core of diversity is recognizing individual value, right? Unique individual value. And we could have a whole other conversation on inclusion and diversity and how that could be elevated in the workplace. But what I would just say that I, I, I heard something interesting. There was, I was talking with a business leader and they were saying probably the most important people that were interested in bringing back into the workplace because we want to make sure we control their environment is a new hire. And we just pulled all of our people who've been here for less than a year. So they've all worked from home through this pandemic. They've onboarded to us and they are of our entire population. The biggest group of people that say we don't want to come into the office because they haven't developed a value system for what experience the office gives them differently than the controlled environment they've created on their own. Kevin, so to your point, this challenge is really a lot less about how we get people back and about how we control their experience. It's much more about creating an environment where people desire to come. Um, and that's not just having big comfy couches um, and quiet meeting spaces. All of those things are great, but it's really re-envisioning how people connect um, when they come together, because I think people should be able to choose that, but they have to have somebody help them understand and imagine what that experience might be. So um, I would just leave on that, that, that I think this, this moment gives us a great opportunity to, to give people choice 
we have the work as organizational leaders to create and reimagine those experiences that become attractors of our people. Thanks, Laura. We really appreciate your time today. I think resilience is defined as the ability to bounce back into our original form. And I think what we're suggesting now is that we have the ability to, to spring forward, not necessarily bounce back into our original form, but spring forward into a new way of thinking and, and help our leadership get there. So hopefully you've taken some really great notes today. Uh, Laura has an article that will be coming out over the next week, and we will uh, make that available to you that will speak more around this topic. And feel free to reach out uh, directly to Laura. You can do that uh, with her information or back uh, through us here at Davis Technical College or the Ames Leadership Institute. We appreciate Amanda Tullis being here that uh, introduces us and brings us in and everything that uh, Davis Technical College does uh, to help us bring these to you. And uh, we'll have another one coming up for you in the next couple of weeks. So, Laura, again, thanks for your time. It's been fun having you in. Thanks, everybody, for thanks, attending. Kevin. Talk to you soon. Cheers.